All right, cool. Hey, everybody. This is Steve Stein, and um, I am honored to be here with Mr. Glenn Drover. How you doing, buddy? Good, thank you. Good. How's your morning going? Do you want me to – hold on, guys. Steve, it says um, I need to press this continue button. Shouldn't I be doing that right about now? You press the continue button? Sure. But I'm not sure what, where it's bringing me here. Okay, yeah, because I've got you. You're you're on the uh, webinar right now. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so I don't know where that's what that's for, but you're here. Okay, now I have you on the full screen. Before I didn't, it had the anyways. Looks like we're good. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so let's just start off. I got a couple of emails from people, Glenn. So if you don't mind, hey, good morning. We've got some people showing up in the chat here, which is awesome. And then we've got people, Glenn, that aren't on the chat as well that are, are watching this right now live. Um, so let's just go through. I've got John from New York, and John says, hey, Glenn, uh, when you first started playing, how much did you practice, and did you have any sort of practice regimen? I used to practice a lot. You see, what happened was basically when I, you know, when I first started really seriously getting into playing guitar, I was about 11 or so, and um, that's where I started to really – I started when I was nine. When I got to about the age of eleven, that's where I was able to start putting pieces together. I was I was introduced to Black Sabbath, so which I feel is, is a great place to start because you know, especially with the older material, it's a little bit slower. Tends to be a lot of them, anyways. A lot of the songs, and that's where I was able to start putting pieces together and um, and just playing along with my records. With records, right? Back then. This is before CDs. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yep. And uh, anyway, so. Um, and, and that's that's where it, I really started to get excited about playing guitar once I got to that point. Because, you know, I try to learn all my, you know, stuff from my favorite records at the time, Sabbath, you know, Iron Maiden, blah, blah, blah. But um, I practice a lot. Every day I practice a certain amount. It wouldn't be like, okay, I'm going to practice from one to four. I just, I just play when I want to play. I never play when I don't want to play. It doesn't make any sense. Right. It's like learning something you don't want, you're not going to use, or you don't like. But you know, why why waste your time? You know, trying to climb that mountain. So I just uh, I just play when I wanted to, which would usually be quite a bit. So I would, you know, I'd spend a certain amount of time during the day in my younger years, you know, um, playing, and then you know, as well as just going out, just hang out with my friends. I would probably do play guitar just as much. You know, I'd spend time, with, you know, for both. So, but there was never any kind of thing that I would have to, um, like a certain, you know, certain things I would work on or whatever I would plan out. I would just do whatever I wanted to do at that time, on that day, whatever. Right. So, yeah. Right. Okay. And then we have Tim, and Tim is from, it looks like Tim is from Ottawa. Yeah. And Tim says, did you, did you ever born, study music theory? What's that? I said, that's where I was born, by the way. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Tim says, did you ever study music theory? No, I didn't. Um, I'm really a street player, to be honest with you. Um, although I understand a lot of it, which I learned from instructional videos when I was growing up and stuff. You know, the earlier ones that came out, I was, you know, like the Vinnie Moore stuff. It was, that's where I was kind of introduced to, you know, um, learning basic, you know, not basic patterns, patterns through modes and, and with modes and stuff. Um, so I kind of learned it that way. I didn't really go to, you know, really study it uh, extensively. I took what I what I needed to what I wanted to learn, and um, I just applied that. But I, I'm I'm really just like a, a street player, to be honest. That's what I call it. I mean, that's, that's the same before you know playing along with music. That's that's what that's my always been my big thing, and still is. I love playing along with albums, whether I'm playing along with what's going on or I'm playing over it. Like I could put something on, like you know, anything I want to play along with, and if I feel like just soloing, I'll just jam over it. So it's more of an ad lib thing. So that's how I became that type of a player. You know, you have two types of players. You have the guys that jam, and then there's the guys that have to know what's coming next. And they're both great, but that's just how I'm wired. So um, I've always been more of a jam guy, even though I do understand what I'm doing. Um, I, I just. I, I went a different way about it than maybe some. Yeah. Well, and that's also, awesome. I mean, when I was growing up, there, there was no, 
there was no way of studying anything. You know, I, I lived in a small town outside of Montreal. There were no teachers there, you know, so we just learned off each other what we could, you know, buddies, you know, this guy would know right. that song. And, you know, we just, that's how we started to, to develop our playing. And then, uh, and then, like I say, later on, I got into bits and pieces through videos and so forth. Right. Cool. Awesome. Now we've got Sophie, and I don't know where Sophie is from, but she says, uh, what do you use for effects panels, if any? Um, I'll show you, because I just have to have them right underneath my feet here. Or, or <laughs> my feet, brother. Um, a couple of interesting ones I, 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 uh, I like to demonstrate in, in other chats that I do. And the, one of the main ones that I use now that I really love, and it's made things a lot easier for me, is this pedal here by Digitech. You probably know that one, Steve. I sure do. So this is uh, what they call the Whammy DT. And um, <clears throat> the one side has, I don't use this very much, but this side here we have, you know, there's just, you could have different settings for harmonizing and stuff like that. And there's some um, whammy effects too. Like, you know, you can control exactly what you, how you want the, the whammy to respond. I'll demonstrate that through sound in, in a few minutes. I, I don't really use this side so much. So it's more the appeal to me is the detuning part. So basically what it does is um, wherever your tuning is, it'll just take you down in increments of half steps or up. So, but I don't usually go up because, you know, I mean, if you're doing the capo thing, that, that would be useful, but for me, it's not. So typically my tunings are, you know, like between D and E flat, depending on the guitar, mm -hmm. like the Les Paul, I usually keep around E flat and most of my other guitars, the more of the, you know, the, the, the Jackson Solis style guitars, I keep those around D and, um, and, and what it does is it will bring the guitar down from whatever tuning you're in, in increments of half steps, like I said. So, you know, basically just going through all the way down to, I think it's like, I can't remember, maybe two, two and a half, uh, whole, uh, two and a half, two st whole steps and a half. <laughs> I'm still trying to wake up. <laughs> and then it'll bring it, and then it's got the octave thing, so it'll bring you down a full octave. And then it's got the, like, the octave pedal effect, which is, you know, the, the octave that you're in plus the lower one. So like the octave pedal, but it's really made things a lot easier for me because I'm always doing sessions online with different tunings. And, um, <clears throat> so it's really easy for that kind of thing. And, you know, instead of having 10 guitars, you know, with different tunings, you know, I could just take one guitar that I want to use and find the tuning that I need to be in like that. <clears throat> and not only that, but um, I'm really, really picky with my tone. So I, if I'm going to record, I'm not going to cut any corners. But this thing, in my opinion, is so stable and sounds so good um, that I use it on recent recordings, you know. And I would never do that. Like I say, I might use it live, you know, just for, you know, just to get around tunings and stuff. But I wouldn't, you know, use it in, in, a, in a recording situation unless it was exactly, you know, unless it was, if it starts messing with my tone, then forget it. But this thing is really, really good. It's very stable. It sounds great. And not only that, but, you know, you change your tuning. Some, if you have a Floyd Rose, it's a big pain in the butt, as we know. You know, doing all that stuff, it takes a little while. But regardless of, of the guitar and, and the setup, for me, it's really cool because you can access all these different tunings, but, that, but you have the same tension on your strings. So it, it's really, it takes care of a lot of issues. I think it's great. I always have it plugged in, and uh, I never... I never play without it. So that's one. So Glenn, is there, yeah, I was going to say, you have another detuning or a, a, another pitch shifting pedal too that you use, don't you? Well, it's the, it's, well, yeah, the, the one that, that's in the videos is the same thing, but just the compact version. So this is the one that I just happen to have here, but the other one, it's the same thing. It's just like, you know, the size of my overdrive pedal, which I'll get to in a minute. Right. So it's that size, you know? like the MXR distortion right. size pedal. And that has just the detuning portion of it. Whereas this one has, you can go lower or higher. And it's got the other side that I was talking about with the, uh, the harmonizing stuff and the whammy effects. And it's right. also that chorus. Do you, find, 
do you find, Glenn, that one seems to track better than the other, or do they seem oh, to work, they all work pretty well? No, and I did quick ABs with them, too. Um, I've been working with Digitech for some time, and I also got, uh, I was working with, um, what's that company, that, the, the other, Morpheus, that's the other company that does the, mm -hmm. the drop pedal. And I don't find really any difference between, I, I might prefer the, the Digitech a little bit more, although it's really, I'm, I'm really having a hard time hearing the difference between that and the Morpheus, but my preference is the Digitech, so that's the one I'm going to recommend, you know. And um, but like I say, if if I was if I didn't have this one or the other or the compact version, and I had a choice, I'd probably just go with the compact version because I don't really use the rest of it. So it's kind of a, it's a big piece that you know. I mean, for here in the studio, it's not a big deal, but you know, for live or something, if you're going right. to jam, it's obviously a lot easier to have something of this size, you know. And it just does the yeah, one right. thing, which is the detuning portion of it. So, but I'll I'll, uh, I'll demonstrate here for a second so you can hear what I'm talking about. So the tuning that I'm in on the Les Paul here is um, is I don't know. Does that sound like standard to you? Maybe E flat. Play it again. Yeah, I'm in E. Yeah, Rough, I'm roughly in E. So. So we have that as a starting point. You engage, and I just brought it down. So now we're eating flat. We're on a D. Sharp. And so forth. As you can hear, it's pretty damn stable. There's no war, but right. in the past, before these units, all the technologies with this kind of thing, the notes would warble and it would, you know, try to find the, the you know, try to stabilize itself. This one doesn't have any issues in that. Hey, noobs, what's going on? So I'll correct myself. Actually, it goes a little bit further. B uh, below the tuning that you're in, it goes, let me count. One full step, two full steps. I'm controlling this with my foot. It's called multitasking. <laughs> so it's actually, it's three, step, three, and a half, uh, three full steps and one half, and then it drops to the octave. So it's like the bass guitar thing, you know, like God of Thunder. Yeah. Or the octave pedal type of thing. And then just quickly, the other side. It's the whammy effect, you know. So what I'm doing now is I'm ascending with the grabbing pedal. We're going up, right? Obviously. Or you can go the other way, I believe, as well. Right? You know, that whole thing, I'm sure you've all been exposed to the whammy pedal. So it's a it's a it's kind of an all in one thing, you know, the whammy pedal, the detuner, a couple of chorus effects, and the harmonizers. The harmonizers I'm not really um, I don't use them that much because the pedal has to be plugged in a different way into it's a, it's a thing where you you if you plug it into the uh, effects loop, you get the true effect of it. If you put it in the front, it's all kind of like all distorted and sound. You know what I mean? So. Yep. Um, Whereas with like the Digitech uh, GSP rack mount, I use that for the harmonizers because it sounds great and it gets it gives me the, the proper 
um, sound that I'm looking for for that the, the for that effect to be produced or how it's produced rather. <laughs> And that's that's awesome. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, let's keep going. I've got another one here. It says uh, this one is from Sam, and Sam is from Michigan. It doesn't say where, but Sam says, uh, "What is your live rig versus your studio rig?" Um. Well, for live, it's actually quite simple. Um. Since probably about 2007 to 2008, I've been using the, the, a rack mount by Digitech called the GSP-1101, which I love to death. We went through, uh, when I was in that band, we, I went through, you know, many different preamps, you know, like uh, the Prophecy by Rocktron, Line 6 stuff, you know. And um, for me, it's, it's my favorite uh, as far as all the newer processes that have come out. So I use that. And what I do is I plug, just plug in straight in with the guitar, and out of the back of the unit, you go into the effects loop of your head, has to have one, and it's got to be two because if it's transistor, it doesn't sound the same with this uh, particular combination. But uh, you just plug, you just go into the effects loop return, and that's it. So in with the guitar in the front, out into the effects loop return. So what that does is basically taking the head and turning it to more of a power amp, using the sounds and everything, you know, the preamp, the, the, the uh, Digitech as, as the tones that you're trying to achieve and then using, you know, taking the the, uh, the head and bypassing the preamp. That's pretty much what it is, right, Steve? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, and, and that's it. And, you know, so it's, there's not one specific head that I'll use or I have to use as long as it's a good tube head, like, you know, a, a good PV, Marshall, Randall, whatever. I've tried them all. I've, I've been in different situations live, and it's pretty much always the same as long as it's a good tube head. You know, I, I, I tried. I was going to um, – one time I was video, um, doing a DVD, and I there was a, a transistor head on stage, and it was completely just really, really – it's just totally brittle and yucky sounding. So – uh, I discovered that day that, you know, it, it was necessary, completely necessary to have a, a tube head. And um, right. cabinets, my preference are, uh, you know, I like Randall's, Blackstar, Marshall, uh, but the speakers I like to use are the 75-watt uh, Celestians because they don't break up as much, so you get a tighter tone. So that's my preference. And... Um, and then you know, of course, the uh, the the, uh, the D two pedal, you know, which is uh, I wasn't using that in Megadeth. They weren't out at that time, and um, I don't think we would have used them anyways because we're always in one tuning. So whether it was right. E or now they're tuned to D, I believe. But when I was in the band, it was still standard tuning, and uh, so we didn't fluctuate our tuning for any particular songs. So um, and, and just an overdrive pedal like the. Uh, I'm always trying different units, you know, different overdrive pedals. And um, this is the one that I've been using for probably the last year or so, and I really like a lot because it doesn't color my tone. It doesn't change it. It just gives me what I want without trying to change things that I've already developed with the preamp. And it's by Blackstar, and it's called the LT Drive. And uh, it's real basic functions, as you can see, level, gain, and a tone. But I don't use a lot of gain from the pedal itself. You know, I'll, I usually have it around 8 o'clock, 8.30, something like that, um, and using the majority of the overdrive from the preamp, just like the old style kind of thing that, you know, was done for many years. The Marshall and the Tube Screamer, usually a lot of people, or I would, I know, and some other people that I knew, you crank the gain so you're getting the full gain, you know, and, and the tone from the head and just using the overdrive to kind of just smooth. Because, you know, when I would try a Marshall, I'd try to play a mar like metal with a Marshall, Without an overdrive, it's a little bit. It's a, it was always a little bit tough. I found, especially with the older heads, because right. there wasn't a ton of overdrive, and the bottom end was kind of loose, and you know, it just it wasn't happening. But with the overdrive pedal, it, it tightens all that up. It gives you, you know, the right amount of gain you're looking for. It gives you better response with the highs and the lows and the whole bit. It just smooths everything out. And um, for that kind of style of music, gives gives you more. You know, it's easy to achieve that tone. So this has always been a part of it of my my setup. It's vital, and um, 
there you have it. Like the, like, you know, the, uh, the Digitech has emulations of pedals inside it and I've tried it, but it doesn't. And I did quick ABs with that. The pedal sounds better than the emulation. If you understand what I'm saying. Right. So. Yeah. And he's totally right guys. I mean, if you, you know, nowadays Marshall's got the JVM and stuff like that, that are a lot heavier, but back in the day, it really was tough to get him to, to push over the edge. Sorry. So you always needed uh, yeah, to I mean, that's, in front of well, that's, that's the thing about now that, you know, the, the good side about what we're dealing with these days is um, <clears throat> there's a lot more, there's a lot more equipment to choose from back when, when I was playing and, you know, growing up playing in bars and cover bands and getting into my first bands, you know, there was Marshall and there was Meza Boogie and, and maybe Randall and, and a couple others. And that was about it. So there wasn't really a ton of uh, options. You didn't have all these units that are out now that have all the, the different amp emulations, you know, and now we're getting into the plugins where you're having, you know, incredible results with, with the plugins now for, for DAWs. So, you know, it's crazy the amount of stuff that's coming out. And the good thing about that is, well, it can be a little bit confusing sometimes. And you're like, where do I start? Where do I go? Cause there's so much, you have this option as I call option anxiety because you just have too much in front of you. But uh, the cool thing is that it's a lot easier to find the tone that's in your head than it was when I was, because I was always striving and I was changing guitars, pedals, amps. I would go into, I would literally go into, like when I was going to buy a head, I remember this one time in particular, and I had like three or four different marshals and I was just going back and forth, plugging in, driving everybody crazy to try to get the one that sounded the way, the way I wanted to sound. Because for those who don't know, you could take two Marshall heads that are the same amp, but they won't sound identical. They all sound slightly different. So unlike, you know, today, if you get a plug-in, you know, a, a, the, the uh, whatever plug-in, which, which is it, like the guitar rig. Oh, amplitude, it's guitar all rig. The same. Yeah, it's all going to yeah. sound the same. You know, there's not going to be any any difference. But that's the way, way it is with, with heads. I don't know these days with technology if, if you can really hear a difference, but when I was getting into trying to develop a tone and really, really getting annoyed that I couldn't find it, that's the way it was. So kind of fun at the same time because you were experimenting and you were really trying to strive for that. Now it's pretty easy. It's The stuff that I have set up now, I, it's, I have it set to the point where it's so efficient that, that it's pretty much just plug and go. Like if I'm doing a bass track, you know, usually it's demo stuff. Um, and I'll have somebody else, you know, that I'm working with or whatever. But regardless, I just have it. I just grab the Warwick that's sitting over there. You can't really see, but uh, that one there, see? And uh, I just plug directly right in. And then there's a, a plug-in by this company called Overloud. And they make this plug-in uh, for the Mark Bass, you know, the Mark Bass heads. If there's any bass players listening. And it's incredible. It sounds amazing. So it's just plug and go. So that's really cool. That's a cool thing. So... Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's that is what's really cool about it is it makes writing on your own at your home all those things so much easier mm -hmm. and so much more consistent. So that's cool. It is. I mean, and it's it's really important these days to try to make it as fit, as efficient as possible in terms of that kind of stuff that you have control over. Because once you get start, you know, and a lot of people are obviously getting into Pro Tools these days because that's what's all the computers are pretty much coming with some kind of a platform of some sort. So everybody's getting into it. Everybody's getting into home recording. Um, whereas years ago, that was, you wanted to record, you had to go to a studio and pay for it, a lot of money. And, um, but it's, it, it's some of it's so sophisticated, depending on what you're doing, that there's a lot of time that you're going to be troubleshooting. There's things, this one, this thing's not compatible with this. So you got to find out how, what's going on with that. And you're on the message boards. And, you know, so there's a lot of, you know, that kind of stuff that's going on. So whenever you can make things, something more simplistic, uh, for me is, is, is better because it takes that crap takes away from, Hey, I just want to record, man. You know? Cause I mean, for me, yeah. I, I was a guitar player at one point, something changed along the way and now I'm doing all these other things, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, you know, when you're telling students, like, you know, going on YouTube, they'll go on YouTube because they want to find how to do this spread fingering or something like that. They wind up watching cat videos for three hours. Right. The same thing can happen with, with gear is like, you just want to record and 
pretty soon it's three hours later and you're dinking with some sort of space echo and the, right, the, the, exactly. The magic and, and that gone, can, be cool. so. it can be cool if you if you want. I mean, when I first got into doing uh, home home studio, you know, engineering as we call it, I guess um, that was about twenty to twenty five years ago. So this none of this stuff existed. There was no computer. No, nobody was using computers back then. It was all tape machines. That's how I started. You know, so a lot of people weren't doing it, and it was all new and exciting. You know, and now it can be the same thing. The only thing I would recommend is somebody getting going. Try not to to get into too many things at once. Try to strip it down and, and, and just use the basic functions and understand what's going on basically before you start adding, oh, what's a compressor? What's this do? I don't know what that parameter does. And, you know, so it, it can be a little bit, you know, daunting. So you want to try to, I, I eased into it. I, I started with a four track machine and a reverb and, and my guitar amp, you know, and a set of speakers. That was, and, and then I just, and then it grew and I got into eight tracks and 16 tracks and 24, and then and then I got into Pro Tools after the tape machines, and um, there you have it. Cool, that's awesome. All right, I got another one from Brian from Wisconsin. Brian says, "What do you do for a daily practice routine nowadays?" Same as I've always done, like we were talking about earlier. Um, it, it's just basically because. Um, because I, I, I wear a lot of different hats now. See, when I was younger, it was I was a guitar player, where I, I tried to be a guitar player. So I would you know, just do that, and that was it. I'd listen to music, I'd play guitar. Now, it's a little different, you know, uh, aside from the fact I have a family. So uh, it's not just me at home anymore, just uh, playing for six hours, you know, um, in my basement, with my, you know, living with my mom. And, um, you know, so there's that, of course. And then there's, you know, um, the fact that, I do a lot of production. I work with a lot of different artists. I do a lot of session work. I do this kind of stuff, you know. So I'm always all, I'm all over the place with what I'm doing. Whether it's doing a, a, a you know some session work for somebody, a solo spot, helping somebody with a mix or mastering, or helping somebody record their project. Because I do a lot of that stuff um, through uh, through Skype and and you know sending files back and forth because now it's, that's, that's the beauty of, of technology now is that we can, before this, you know, we, we would have to send tapes back and forth, you know, so you're going sending FedEx and you wait a week or two before Buddy would, now we're doing stuff in minutes, which is crazy. So I'm able to do this whole interactive thing on, uh, through Skype where, you know, I have my student my, or, or somebody, my client that I'm working with, We'll, you know, be working on some of their music. They'll have a riff. I'll help them with that. And then we'll just start developing, you know, doing doing drums. I do a lot of the easy drummer stuff. So we can develop that, which sounds incredible. You know, I'll get him to record a little guitar part, and then I'll do one. And then we'll just kind of, just kind of, just like somebody here, like if me and Steve were in the same room, we're just, hey, let's record a song. Same kind of thing. So we're just getting together and, you know, and just, you know, doing our parts. You play bass. I'll play guitar. You do this. And. You know, just just that kind of that that whole thing, developing music and having fun with that. So I do that a lot as well. So it's not just a, yeah. I mean, as far as practicing, I just basically play when I can and I want to. So, but it's not as much as I used to. Right. Same. And guys, it's important to understand what Glenn's saying here because I mean, needless to say, being creative is is just as important if not more important for many players than it is understanding all the logic behind or the history behind something, it, it's being able to spend time being creative. And needless to say, Glenn does a lot of that. I mean, if you listen to a lot of his solo work and all those sorts of things, he he comes up with some really cool stuff. And the only way you can do that is you've got to just explore your environment, your fretboard, your, your musicality, your gear, whatever it might be, you know? Well, I mean, and the cool thing these days, too, is you have, you do have the help of YouTube. And, I, and, you know, people say, yeah, there's a lot of crap on there. Well, there's going to be a lot of everything, you know. So, but, you know, the, the cool thing is you can, you can pick up. There's a lot of really cool initial stuff that you can get into, as well as, of course, the stuff that Steve has done here and I have done on the site, which you guys have access to. But, I mean, either, there's a lot of, you have a lot more outlets now for learning stuff, whereas when, when I was growing up, there was nothing you know, it was record, right. man. It was just whatever I can pick up with my ear, you know, and buddy down the street, you know, there's a guy, the local uh, town guitar hero, this guy I really looked up to. You know, I was just a punk in grade six or seven. He was an 11, so, and I really, and he was a really good player. 
and he knew how to do the little thing from eruption. So I say, man, can you show me that? I bugged him to death until he did. And, and I bugged this guy to show me how to do this. And, and that's the way it was, you know, which is, it was fun. Yep. And I, I'm glad I grew up with that. But now it's just, you just go to, you know, wherever, you know, like I say, if you're Steve, you know, you got all these different uh, possibilities of uh, learning all these different techniques that you want to learn and, and try to achieve what you want to, you know, as far as playing and stuff. So definitely uh, right. very cool. Yep. Cool. All right. The next one is it's uh, Dan from Austin, Texas, and it says, how do you approach doing solos in bands like Megadeth or Testament? Do you play them like the actual solos, or do you do your own thing? If I'm understanding the question, are you talking about when I'm covering a solo or when I'm doing something? It some sounds like it, yeah. Okay, excuse me. Um, well, no, I mean, there's the... the <laughs> Uh, okay. All right. So basically with that whole thing is uh, everybody's got their own approach, I suppose. When you're in a band like Testament or King Diamond, that when I was when I was in those playing with those guys, I, no one said you have to play this exactly like this. I think it was just like they, they would expect that you would do try to do the right thing. And um, in my opinion, what is right and is realistic is that you're not that guitar player. And if you want to be a clone of somebody, God love you. But for me, I, I really like individuality. I don't like hearing the same thing and the same thing played by the same person over and over and over because it's like anything in life, it gets boring, same thing. So it's really cool when I see somebody expressing themselves as well as trying to maybe, you know, play parts of those solos that, you know, that you want to hear and you remember. So for me, what I would, the way I would approach it is I would try to play the solos as close as I could. You know, like in Megadeth, it's like that was the thing with that band that I dislike because a lot of, of the fans and some of the members don't care about that. They just want you to play the solos like Marty Friedman. And that's cool. But that's, you're not Marty Friedman. Marty Friedman is Marty Friedman. But how about seeing what this guy's got to offer? That somehow doesn't seem to uh, be a, a thought or a, or a consideration. So where with the other bands, I thought it was cool because you can, you can play, you try to play the solo, especially the key melodies, as close as you could so that, you know, those... Those parts that you know you, you remember that the, the more melodic parts maybe of a solo are there, you know that's cool because I don't like to hear somebody play something completely different and be completely self-indulgent. I don't. I'm not saying that because that's too far the other way. I would rather me for the perfect blend is to try to put your own stamp on something that already exists. You know because you you have your own DNA, man. You know we all are have our own thing. Some people, that's why you can tell a lot of guitar players by their vibrato, by the way they bend, their tone. It's, it's, they, everybody has their own little thing. Not to say everybody's completely original, but there's a lot of players, like if you put them on, I'll be able to tell you who it is because of certain tones and the way they express themselves. Sure. But I would try to do that. Try to play solo, you know, make it, you know, close, but at the same time, you know, have my own kind of feel in there as well. And, and, and that's what makes it more natural too. Because if you're trying to play something note for note and it's completely like trying to bring it down to like a mathematical equation, then you just sound like a robot. And who wants that? That's not a musical expression type of thing. And that was the thing that always frustrated me in that band is that it was never considered, you know, to like right. express yourself. It was, it was considered that you're supposed to copy somebody. But then this guy says, yeah, and then the next guy says, yeah, yeah, you should, you know, I just, I, I don't, I don't dig that. That was one thing that did make me unhappy, as a matter of fact. Right. Hey, I got to ask you on a, on a personal level, how did you get hooked up with King Diamond? Uh, that was my first pro gig, if you want to say they called that. Um, uh, I, um, it was the early 90s, and by about 91 or 92, if you followed the band from the beginning like I did, which was around the mid-80s, every right. album to have a different guitar player, except for Andy, who was the other guy that was always being replaced. So Sean's like, my brother Sean said, why don't you send him a, a, a video of you playing some of the songs? Because I would, I was a freak of King Diamond, you know, that stuff. 
when it's not, I was always, I got into Merciful Fate more so later, but when King Diamond came out, I, that really, once we got to Abigail and all, I was a hardcore fan. Right. It was King Diamond and Fate's Warning, that was the only two bands I listened to. And um, around that time. And um, so I'm like, yeah, okay, I could send something, but you know, I, I was like, this is kind of weird because why would they look at someone across the pond? There's tons of guitar players there. They were in, you know, located in, in Sweden and Denmark at that point. And, uh, but anyways, long story short, I made a video of me playing about four songs, maybe a Merciful Fate song or two, and a guitar solo. And I just basically it was just a videotape, video camera, just looking at me. I'm sitting on my bed in my bedroom, and I'm playing along with the songs. I did a solo, and I sent it. And, um, and they liked it. And I, I thought it was just kind of whatever. You know, I, I didn't think they were going to, you know, again, like I said before, there's all kinds of guitar players there. Why would they look at somebody way over where I live? Which was Toronto at the time, so that's uh, what happened. He, they liked the tape, and uh, and then we started talking. At that point, he did have a replacement for the guy that was gone. At that point, when I sent, uh, or the guy that left previous, uh, when I sent the videotape, and um, but cutting it down short, he said, you know, I talked to King, and he said we really like the tape, and you know, if something comes available, we'll let you know because we, you know, it sounds like you could be a, a good fit, style wise. Right. And um, so we remained in contact for years. And then one day he called me. It was like 1997 or something. And I just, I was working for an airline. No, I wasn't a pilot, but I was working for an airline and um, I didn't have enough seniority in this particular company. So a bunch of us were laid off. And uh, that was the last job I ever actually had. And then everything since then has been music. So ever since I got the King job, it's all been music. Wow. That's awesome. Cool. All right. Well, Trev's got a question here on the chat. It says, do you prefer being wired or wireless? And if wireless, what rig do you use? I would prefer being wireless. I mean, it's, I have a little bit of the Ace Freely disease, so I'm a little klutzy, you know. It looks like I've had a few drinks, but sometimes I have it. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, wireless is always a good thing. And uh, obviously, it's, it's nice to get rid of and, you know, um, Get rid of some of the just excess crap that's on stage, which makes things easier. Um, so you're not tripping over anything, you know. But I'm not really a big authority with what's going on right now these days. There's a lot of new stuff, things that are out that I'm sure that are just mind blowing. But um, the one that um, is this one plugged in? Hold on a minute. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so this one here, this is an older unit that's actually not available anymore. They don't make them anymore. I don't know if you you uh, you recognize this one, Steve, but it's it's uh, I think the company was called X2, right? X2. Yeah. So these guys the were X2 was they were purchased by by Line Six. Right. So Line Six bought them and did something with it. I think they call what do they call it? Relay. I don't remember. I, I had a few of them, but I don't remember. Right, so, but this one was, um, I got this when I was in, uh, when I was doing the Testament stuff. I was talking to Michael Amok, which is from a, a, a guitar player from a band called Arch Enemy. And um, we always talk about gear, and he's a, he's a freak with pedals and stuff like I am, and always experimenting with the overdrives like I was talking about before and stuff. But anyway, that this unit here was, um, he recommended getting that one because I was, in between companies at that one point, and he recommended. He said, "Man, it's really, really good. Super easy to use, you know." And uh, so I called him up, and we went from there. And, and I love it. It's 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 a digital uh, system, and um, but the thing is, yeah, you can make make it a fight at eBay or something these days. But um, but man, it's it's a super system if you can find one. So digital, awesome. and I never had any problems with it. Never cut out of nothing. So better than a lot of more ex really expensive ones that I, I used in the past. So that's it. And then the stuff before that, I can't remember exactly the models I, I used. But anyway. Cool. All right, let's keep going. We've got another question here. Uh, I don't have a name on this one. It says, when writing your own material, how do you first approach it? And then what do you do? What do you do first, and then next, and so on? So I'm assuming, like, if you were just sitting around and you decided, "Hey, I'm going to write something," kind of, how does the process work for you, Glenn? 
I just, I'll just work with, um, well, sometimes I, I shouldn't say all the time. Sometimes I'll just mess around and come up with riffs and stuff. And if I, you know, stumble upon something I like, I'll start to do, try to develop it. And it could be an intro to a song, could be a chorus, could be anything. Um, that was the typical way I used to do it. Now, I might do that sometimes still, but one tool that I, th I think is really cool to experiment with, going back to the recording thing, if there's any of you guys out there that uh, are doing home recording and might you know be using Pro Tools or whatever, you have the Easy Drummer. I know a lot of people have the Easy Drummer program. Noobs, you know exactly what I'm going to say here. But anyway, so... Uh, by the way, Noobs is a guy that's, you know, he's always in, uh, um, in the uh, jam play chats that I do. So he's a longtime awesome. friend and he's always, he's always coming in and talking. So it's always good to have him. And anyway, so um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just kind of mess around with different patterns, different MIDI patterns that are in, that's in uh, Easy Drummer. Something that, you know, I, that might appeal to me. And I'll, you know, I'll hear a particular type of, of, of beat, pattern, whatever. And then I'll just start kind of working riffs around it. And that's how I wrote, like, uh, there's a couple of singles that I put out in the last couple of years that's going to be part of this album I'm doing with a bunch of different singers, guest singers. Like the one I did with Todd from Queensryche was written completely around drum parts that I liked. I thought, wow, I can really mess around. And I was using, I was messing around with the, uh, the detune pedal, so accessing some lower, heavier tuning. And that's how that song was, uh, how it was arranged. So I might do it like that sometimes, but um, there's a lot of different possibilities. If it's instrumental, you know, it's a little bit different because then you've got to consider if you're writing an instrumental, is there going to be melody lines? Is there not? Is it, you know, what, you know, if it's vocals, then, you know, then it's, it's that thing. So it all depends on what you're going for. And that uh, for me will determine what the plan of attack is going to be. Is it going to be just starting out with, you know, um, like I said, the easy drummer thing has been very, very uh, uh, useful and, and just doing it the old way. So so there's not one specific way to do it, you know, but that's I, I think you should experiment and find what works for you. And you might find you, you might want to do it multiple ways like the way I do it, you know. But I don't think there's ever been a time where there's been like a song with vocals where it was like the vocals were, were written first and we wrote the music. I've never done that. So it's always been the music and then having, you know, trying to marry, you know, uh, lyrics to that and, and melodies. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, then you just trash it and try again or, or whatever. And that's certainly happening. But uh, thankfully, more than not, um, we, haven't, uh, we haven't had too many of those problems where, you know, we were, we were unhappy with something, putting something together. Whether All right, I've got a question for you, Glenn. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No. Oh, no, just it, from a personal level, if you were to take the personalities of the people that you've played with and you were going to throw that aside, if you could, who are some people that you've written with that you really either admire the way that they write or you're very compatible with the way that they write? Mm. Besides your brother, obviously. Yeah, well, that's an obvious one. We've been doing that forever, so that was obviously. Right. Um, <clears throat> Well, with Dave, it was it was cool. I mean, I didn't really do uh, there were there were things that I wrote that didn't make up, make it on the album. There was stuff uh, a, a part of one song that I did. I worked uh, the album I did with them. One of the songs they did a part like a, a, a middle section or something, and that was fun. It was something that was created actually close to the end of the al albums uh, the album being recorded. It was a, a song that we added as a bonus because we felt that we didn't have enough material, so we were in England at Andy Sleep Studio. And uh, it was just the three of us, and me and Andy and, and uh, Dave um, were messing around. And I came up with something. He said, "Yeah, that's cool, you know." And I remember one night we we're all supposed to go to dinner. I said, "Man, just let me. I'm going to stay here. I want to work on this." And I came up with the clean part and the and the, the theme, the guitar melodies that went on top of that. And so by the time they came back, I had something developed, and then we went and laid it down. And but the initial ideas are are, are, are just working on stuff together. Me and Dave would do that on stage and sound checks. We do it backstage. So you know, we you know, it, it could have, it could have went further if, if I would have stayed in the band, but I didn't. So, um, but that was good. With King, I didn't write anything, so there was no collaboration there of that. I was only on the one album, so I don't really have a whole lot of experience with other people. You know, aside from Sean, Dave a little bit. You know, and then some of the you know, like uh, I was mentioning before, Todd from Queensrÿche working on that song and. 
stuff like that. Right, right. So. Um, Noobs is saying, does Glenn ever play extended range guitars? What? Explicit. It says, does Glenn ever play extended range guitars? What the hell is that? <laughs> okay, so what do you mean by that? Totally over my head. That went right over my head. Still too early. I'm not sure if you mean more strings or if you mean more frets or well, yeah, you, you, mean, you, you, you might be joking. You might be joking. Okay. Because <laughs> yeah, we're not sure. Uh, I got another one here. I, this is the last one I got, buddy. It says, um, what was your favorite band you ever played with and why? Um, I, I don't know if I have a favorite because they were all, <clears throat> they all had their own unique situation, even though the, the you know, the music with some of the bands was somewhat similar. Like say, if you were going to, I guess, compare Testament to Megadeth, Testament's a little heavier. Yes. But you know, they still come from the same kind of idea. Uh, and even King to a certain point, but there was all, you know, it's very unique. Uh, all those situations. I think, the one that I probably had, I don't even, it's hard to say. I was going to say the most fun, probably Testament, but then I had a lot of fun in King too. But if I had to pick one, the most fun in the people that I, I, you know, working with, the group of people I was working with and just the whole vibe and everything that, you know, that, that went down, I'd have to pick Testament. Even though my brother was yeah. in Megadeth, I'd still have to say it was my most, that was, and really, I mean, I wasn't even really, to be honest with you, I, I, I was just doing a lot of fill-in work for, for, uh, Alex, when he was doing TSO in his in his jazz band, so I, I I didn't plan on any of the albums, but you know, and there's still that possibility of playing and doing more work with them, but because we still talk and we talk about it, but um, but as far as just yeah, just being in one of these bands and, and, and playing and doing all that stuff, playing live, whatever, it was, that was the most fun. Because I play, I like playing live a lot more than being in the studio. So being in the studio is cool, but. After a while, it gets you know kind of on, on my nerves. So, right, cool. Well, awesome. It looks like Noob said seven, eight, or nine string guitars. Do you play any of those? Okay, that's what I thought. I wasn't going to say because I didn't want to feel stupid if I was wrong. <laughs> um, no, I, I tried the seven and um, I didn't like it. I, I just couldn't. I couldn't. Six is confusing enough for me, so I just stick with that. <laughs> And, and going beyond that, forget it. I mean, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's really cool stuff. But for me, I, I just, I, I'm more into, you know, I'm very kind of narrow-minded, I guess, to a point. I like the Les Paul style guitars. And I like the, um, you know, like the, uh, that one over there. <clears throat> that, those shape guitars. And uh, that's about it. You know, I never got into any of the funky shapes. Um, and, uh, and anything more than six strings. I try, Like I said, I tried it. I experimented with a couple of guitars that I had. Just at the end of the day, I just I didn't, didn't work out. just didn't like it. So and I don't like the response of the E string open, too, on a, seven, on a seven string. It's got a different response. It's a little bit more dull sounding, and it just doesn't have the brightness and the growl that you can achieve with a six string. Um, so that's one thing as well I don't like. Right. So... I'm good with six and my detune pedal. I'll make it sound like a seven string, no problem. You'll never know the difference. <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. Well, guys, everybody, thank you so much for being on this on this call with Glenn. Glenn, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to hang out with us. Yeah, no problem, man. Yeah, and um, so we'll talk soon, Glenn. And everybody, have a great day and uh, keep on practicing. And yeah, exactly. Yep. We'll be back Before in a couple fun. of weeks. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Take care. See ya.